Hey y'all and welcome back. So if you are here, that means that you watched part one because y'all see the part two on this thing. So if you have not watched part one of this video, it was a longer video. So decided probably after that second piece to go ahead and chop this into two parts. And in the first part, we talked about submission, which is what we're going to continue to talk about. But we talked about it within the context of being God's daughter. So it's so it's, it's so important to recognize that our identity is in God and our identity is in Christ and we are daughters of the most high God. That that's the first relationship that we develop. It's the first relationship that we come to know even before we come to know our parents. God recognizes us and chooses us to be his daughter. And so that's what we talk about in the first part. And we talk about what submission looks like as daughters of God. So listen to that and then come back. I'll be here when you get back. We're not going to leave you out here. Come back and you can jump into the second part of that same video or that same topic. So today we are jumping into part two of this conversation we laid the foundation last week about or around being a daughter first and what submission looks like as a daughter of God. Today, we are going to be talking about not just what it looks like to be submitted as a daughter of God, but how do we submit as daughters first and wives? How do you, how do you stay submitted as God's daughter, but now you are introduced to a man of God that has gotten down on his one knee that has proposed to you, that has left his mother, his father to cleave to you, what happens then? Like, okay, so now we're used to being submitted to God. I've been rocking with God. I've been single. And now there is a dramatic shift, right, that takes place when you get married. It's a huge transition. And we'll talk about that in separate videos, just marriage. That's a whole separate, the transition to prepare for marriage is a, it's an entirely separate topic. But what I want to say here is, again, setting that foundation as God's daughters first is critical. So in your season of singleness, I will, I will repeat this in the same way that I did the first video. In, the season of, in your season of singleness, that is the most critical season for you. And here's why I say this, because in your season of singleness, this is where you develop your relationship with God. You develop your relationship with you. You figure out who you are and the things that you enjoy, the things that you don't enjoy, that you don't care for. You begin to become more aware of who you are and how you move under your submission to God as a daughter of God, how you move in the world, how you show up, right? How people receive you. You start to learn things about all that stuff. So the reason that singleness and that season is so important is because we that singleness season gives us time to focus on ourselves. It gives you time to focus on your relationship with God. It gives you time to heal. It gives you time to really look at how you're living, assess things, reflect. And your responsibilities, I'm not taking any, I ain't, I ain't disrespecting nobody, but your responsibilities as a single woman compared to what the responsibilities and your role is as a married woman will change drastically. So in the season where you're single and you have you to be responsible for, when you have you to grow and when you have you to care for and you to prioritize, as a single woman, that is the time to dive deep into what the work that you need to do on yourself, the work that you are called to do by God. Okay. So I would encourage you definitely to start by expressing the importance of your singleness season. So if you find yourself right now in your singleness season, being upset, feeling some type of way, feeling angry, talking to God and telling him you need to hurry up, like, where's my husband? I get that you have a desire for that, but I want to submit to you that there is a reason that you are in this season. And if you miss it, I'm here to tell you that becoming somebody's wife is not going to heal stuff that you didn't deal with in your singleness season. Being submitted to a husband is going to be a lot harder if you did not learn how to submit to your father in heaven. And if you did not know how to yield to your father in heaven, if you didn't develop a relationship with your father in heaven when you were single, it's a lot harder. It's not impossible. I'm not saying that you can't, that this can't be done, 
But a lot of that groundwork that God gives us room to do in our singleness season, it can be really easy to miss the opportunity that we have available if all we are all we have our eyes set on is getting a ring, if all we have our eyes set on is being somebody's wife, we will miss the sacredness of our singleness season. So for all my single ladies, okay, hear me, hear my heart in this. I'm not asking you to to leave your desire for a husband at the door. I'm not asking you to change that desire. Keep that desire in your heart if that is what if that's the desire that you have. However, going back to video part 1 of this video, be sure that you recognize the sacredness of your singleness season. Be sure that you recognize your identity and that you know your identity as a daughter of God first before you try to change your last name. Understand that you have, that you share, that you share the lineage and that you are walking into the inheritance of the Most High God. That's who you are. So don't get, don't get the game mixed up. Don't think that when you walk into marriage, this is going to be the best thing, that this is going to best, this is going to be the best thing that you've ever seen and that there's nothing that will compare. I want you to be so excited about your relationship with God, about being God's daughter. If you can appreciate that, and find joy in that thing, you will enjoy all the more and find even more joy in your marriage because you have come to love your father, who is going to then bring you your husband, who then is going to be the one that you're submitted to and he's submitted to God, but you still got your relationship with God. You know what I'm saying? So we'll get into that in just a second. So that's what we're talking about today. I just had to take a few minutes to encourage you if you're listening to this and you are you have that desire to be a wife you have a desire to find the man that God has for you or for him to find you amen so you have that desire nothing is wrong with having the desire but i encourage you to not neglect this season of singleness to lean into this season of singleness to lean into who you are as a daughter of God and i promise you I promise you that as you lean into your identity as a daughter of God, the son of the sons of God, they're going to recognize that you're working. They're going to recognize that you are set apart. They're going to recognize that there's something special about this one. There's something distinct about her that I want to pursue. There's something distinct about her that I need to add to myself in order to become more like the God that I'm submitted to. Because it's important that the man that chooses you is submitted to God, especially if you've spent all this time preparing and especially if you spent all this time submitting yourself to God, it's going to be a lot harder to come into agreement with a man of God or with your husband if he is not submitted to God, if he has not done that same work for himself in his single season. I'm not saying any of this, God can't come in, fix, build up. But do the work that you can in your singleness season to prepare the way for what it looks like to be an excellent wife, which is what we're going to go ahead and shift into now. So what does it look like to be an excellent wife? And then we'll talk about what submission as an excellent wife looks like. So when I think about what an excellent wife looks like, and we've heard this time and time again, but I want to zone in on Proverbs chapter 31, Proverbs 31. And this is, what I find interesting is that many people go right to talking about the description of the woman in this chapter. But I do want to have you, if you have not already, be sure to pay attention also to those first nine verses because verse 10 is where it really gets into the description of a worthy woman. And then verses one through 10 are actually from a mother to her son who was actually a king. So this is a mother speaking to her son in verses one and nine, instructing him in the way that he is supposed to be going, instructing him, warning him, letting him know that, all right, I know it's a lot of stuff out here. I know it's a lot of pretty girls to look at, but don't be, don't be bringing no foolishness in the house. Don't be throwing your pigs, to, don't be throwing your seed to the swine and to the pigs. Okay, don't just be out here drinking whatever and out here loose in the streets because that's going to prevent you from being able to walk in the calling that you've been graced to carry. Okay, so that's what the, the chapter starts out with that. So if you've not taken the time to actually read 
how this mother is talking to the king or talking to her son in this case, the things that she's warning him to look for even before she gets to the description of a worthy woman, because it's going to be difficult, okay, for even regardless of how worthy we are, there's work that needs to be done from the men of God. The men of God have to come correct. The men of God have to be in a certain heart posture to even recognize how valuable and how worthy you are. Because if they are not submitted, if they don't know what Proverbs 31 says, if they are not sober minded, if they are not healed, if they're not submitted and yielding, they don't even know how to look for a worthy woman. They don't know what to look for in a worthy woman because they're looking for more of the things of the world, which is why those verses warn the men of God specifically against the things that could really send them down the path that may lead them to not a worthy woman, but a different type of woman. Okay. So the description of a worthy woman starts Proverbs 31 verse 10 is where it starts. And it really goes through the end but I find that it's it's important to go ahead and read through this for the sake of this portion of the video, because there are going to be pieces of this that specifically talk and describe, talk to and describe the wife, the role that we have as wives. So for wives that are listening, for those that aspire to be a wife, right, because that is something that God has ordained us to do as his daughters. He has set that ministry aside for us if that is something that we a, choose if we're prepared and cho choose to walk into that, but also if that's something that God has for us in general. So he's prepared that ministry for his daughters and the ministry being being a wife, being a helper to the husband. It is not good for man to be alone, okay? That's not me being petty. I love my husband, but I'm here to tell you, and he will tell you that it is not good for man to be alone. We were created as God's daughters to come and stand alongside them to help them. Okay, but again, first we were designed to be daughters and then we were designed as a second ministry. Okay, so we're supposed to minister unto God, we're supposed to do everything as we would unto the Lord. And that includes the ministry to our husbands. So the description of a worthy woman, pieces of this will apply to all women, okay? If you are aspiring to be a worthy woman, okay, there are pieces that are going to apply in here to you. And then there are pieces that are going to give wives specific instruction. Verse 10 says, an excellent woman, one who is spiritual. I'm reading in the Amplified Bible, which is usually my preferred version, my preferred, excuse me, version when I'm using the Bible app. So an excellent woman one who is spiritual, capable, intelligent, and virtuous, who is he who can find her? An excellent woman, who is he who can find her? Her value is more precious than jewels and her worth is far above rubies or pearls. That thing, that thing speaks for itself. In other words, it's not just going to be any type of man that's even going to be capable of recognizing the value that you bring to the table. If you are living your life in submission to God, a man who is even worthy of a worthy woman will be the one that can recognize the worthiness within you. I pray that that, I pray that you catch that. I pray that that makes sense. It says her value is more precious than jewels and her worth is far above ruby, rubies or pearls. So we should not have to remind a man who is worthy of our worthiness, according to this, of our value. If we are trying to scream and remind people and send them multiple, it shouldn't take a bulk of reminders and alarms. If a man is worthy of your worthiness, he should not need to be reminded of what your value is. He should be able to recognize it and he should honor it. So it says her value is more precious than jewels. Her worth is far above rubies or pearls. Here is where we hear about the heart of her husband. The heart of her husband trusts in her with secure confidence and he will have no lack of gain. So there is every, he has everything to gain, nothing to lose when he finds a worthy woman, an excellent woman, one who, a woman of virtue, right? A, a precious jewel, someone that he treasures, okay? According to, living according to the things that God has given us to live by. Verse 12, she comforts, 
encourages and does him only good and not evil all the days of her life. So this is again, speaking to the heart of her husband. This is where she begins to talk specifically to uh, in the context of marriage, if she's using husband as she's talking to her son in these verses. She goes on to say, wives should be comforting, encouraging, and we should be doing our husbands good, not evil, all the days of our life. So that is another thing that we should consider and think about, not just as daughters, because we can look at all of this as daughters in our single season and still glean from this and still prepare and become a worthy woman as the worthy man is being prepared for you and as you are being prepared for him, okay? So she comforts, encourages, and does him good and not evil. She looks for wool and flax and works with willing hands and delight. So this is not a woman that's sitting on her behind being lazy, but this is a woman that's willing to do the work. This is a woman that's willing to use her hands, get dirty, someone that is strategic and that is willing to work. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her household food from far away. Once again, if I'm bringing food from far away, that means that I might've had to trot a few miles. If I didn't have a donkey at that time, if I didn't have, if I don't have a car, like we're even if I do have a car and I'm taking the time being strategic about the time that I leave, I'm taking care of my, taking care of my house. I'm not, that means that I'm not making any excuses about providing for my house and making sure that we have what we need as a wife. So consider that as well when we're thinking about the roles of what it looks like to be an excellent wife, excellent woman. Verse 15, she rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and assigns tasks to her maids. This is saying, okay, this is a woman that is not sleeping all through the day. This is a woman that is, she's watchful, she's strategic. She is mindful of the house. She is a keeper of the house. She is tending to the things that need to be done in the house. She's tending to her family. She is delegating tasks. It says here she assigns tasks to her maids. Okay, so those could be people that are assigned to help you. Okay, because I don't know how many, I don't have any maids in this season. And even when I do get to that place, I'm not planning on calling them maids. But in this season or in this particular time, maids were something that were a lot more common. So if you had maids in the house, these were servants. These were people that were there to essentially help you with anything that needed to be done around the house, especially when it comes to cleaning and maintaining. So a wife, an excellent wife is one that is mindful, that is a good manager of time. So as wives, we need to be good managers of time. We need to be mindful about our house. So we need to take care of what belongs to us. That means we shouldn't be having a raggedy house. So if we can't take care of our house in our single season, I can let you know now that when you when you come together and you become one with another human being that's been living life a whole different way, if you can't find order in your own life, then it's going to be difficult to create order or try to find order when you bring two together to become one. Okay, so be mindful of your house, take care of your house, your family, and be one to delegate. So if you need this, I think that this is critical too, because it also it highlights the fact that even though there's a lot that this woman is doing that we as wives are called to do, to care for the house, to care for our family, to be strategic, we also need to be willing and wise enough to know when to ask for help, to delegate tasks. So we'll get to that in a moment, but when it comes to being a wife, when it comes to being a partner, which is something that we hear a lot within the context of how God defines marriage between a woman and a man, right, a male and a female, when we're thinking about that, it's critical to not get to a place as wives where we think that we are expected or it's even important that the husband does not get to a place where they become expectant of the wife to carry the load on everything, okay? It's important for us to be willing to delegate because I know that some of us, we don't want things done in a raggedy fashion. So sometimes we're willing to just break our necks, okay, <laughs> break our backs or just put ourselves in a tough situation 
to try to get everything done. But in reality, delegation and getting your time back so that you can focus so that you can really show up in your role as a wife is so important. So make sure that you're delegating tasks. Make sure that you're asking your husband for help. Ask him to support you when you need the support. And if for any reason your husband may not be available to take care of specific tasks, delegation does not just mean to your husband. Delegation, if you if you and your husband have children, you can delegate some tasks to your children. You may even hire some folks that can come in and take care of tasks around the house for you or in your lives in general. So being a delegator of things that need to happen in order to maintain the house, house meaning the the movement of things, man, maintaining the finances if that falls under your if that falls under your role within your marriage, all those things. Not being afraid to delegate, to ask for help, and to assign things to people that are gifted in those areas. And if that allows you to maintain your house while also keeping a smile on your face and staying submitted, that's what we got to do. Amen. Okay. Verse 16, she considers, she considers a field before she buys or accepts it, expanding her business prudently with her profits she plants fruitful vines in her vineyard. Okay, so listen, we are supposed to, we are the creation. God is the creator. We are the daughter. He is the father. We have been made in the image of God. So that means we are creators also. We are creators. We're not the creator. We are creators. And so here it talks about, again, being not just strategic and delegating things around the house, but being women that are intellectual, being women that are interested in learning and developing systems, putting plans into place and executing them. So that can be in the form of a business or a service, right? But inspecting things and looking at things from a critical place, an analytical place, but not going into things haphazardly, having done our research, right? We just want to be intellectual. We want to ask questions and we want to be wise about what we do. So if we do start a business, if we do make an investment, we want to make sure that whatever the profits are that we gain, that we're being good stewards. So this talks about stewardship. This talks about analyzing the opportunities that come our way as wives, as excellent women. Those are things that we should be considering. Okay. All right. Verse 17, she equips herself with strength and makes her arms strong, okay? So Amplified has a couple of words in between spiritual, mental, and physical fitness for her God-given task. So in other words, keep yourself up. Keep yourself up. Take care of your temple. Take care of your mind. Temple meaning the dwelling place of God, your body. So your mind, body, and your spirit, okay? Making sure that you're doing whatever needs to be done to maintain good health, good health in all those areas. Because in order for us to do what we've been called to do, first as God's daughters, but then secondly, as wives to our husbands, we can only do that if we are in, if we are at a place of optimal health, okay? So we have to take care of ourselves. Verse 18, she sees that her gain is good. Her lamp, her lamp does not go out, but it burns continually through the night. She is prepared for whatever lies ahead. So we are women of preparation and strategy. So that means that we are not thinking just about this week, but we're thinking about next month and the month after that. What are things that we need to be preparing for now for what is to come? How can we continue to have foresight as God gives us insight? Okay, she stretches out her hands to... She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens and extends her hands to the poor. She reaches out her filled hands to the needy. So that means when I have, I give. When people need, I give. Okay. I extend my hands to the poor. I reach out my filled hands to the needy. So that means people can take, not take from me, but I'm, I'm willing to give. I'm generous. She does not fear the snow for her household, for all in her household are clothed in scarlet. 
This means that again, going back to what we said, we're not just thinking about right now. We're not thinking about the now, but we have the foresight. When we ask God for wisdom, that means we're asking him for his mind. So we're asking him for his foresight. We're asking him for understanding about the now and even understanding about what was and knowledge for how to really maneuver when it comes to preparation. So be prepared. Think about the things that you can do to set yourself up, not just for now, but for the future. Okay, it goes on. I'll skip to verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Okay, so I think it's interesting that she's going, she's describing a worthy woman, but she's also throwing in important attributes and characteristics of what the husband of a worthy woman looks like. The husband is known in the city's gates when he sits among the elders of the land. So as we, and that'll be something we maybe talk about another time, but for the husbands, in order for us to really serve in the way that we're called to as wives and as daughters of God, it's important too that the husband once again be the covering, be the high priest of the house, be the head of the house, meaning that he's covering you. As you're covering all the things that we're talking about, as you are managing and delegating all these things, God has assigned the man, your husband, to be the covering of the house. Once he leaves his mom and his father, he's supposed to cleave to you. He's supposed to cover you and make you look more like Jesus Christ and vice versa. Okay, so in other words, your husband should be known for these things. Your husband should be known as a man of God. Your husband would be well known if he walks with you. If he's walking with a worthy woman, that means that he should be looking more like Christ and you should be looking more like Christ because you're with him. All right, let's see, let's see. There's a lot of verses here, but I will, I'll pause after 26. Verses 25 and 26, strength and dignity are her clothing and her position is strong and secure and she smiles at the future. Again, knowing that she and her family are prepared. She opens her mouth in skillful and godly wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. So I'll stop there at verse 26, but I encourage you to read verses 10 all the way through the end. Wisdom is our portion as worthy women. Strength and dignity are things that we literally wrap ourselves up in because why? We have submitted ourselves to God as daughters first, and so once we step into the assignment and into the, into the ministry of being a wife, strength, dignity, wisdom, kindness, joy, all of these things, giving instruction, right? Being loving, all of these things are the things that we are gifted, we are graced with when we step into that role as wives. Okay, so a lot is said in Proverbs 31, a lot that I kind of I could have probably gone deeper into, but I want you to review that and allow that to be the study for, for yourself, whether you are a wife right now or whether you aspire to be a wife and you are you are standing as a daughter of God right now and not yet a wife. I encourage you to study Proverbs chapter 31, again, all the way through, verses one through the very end for the reasons that I shared at the beginning. So what does submission look like as we wrap up this video? What does submission look like now that we know what a worthy woman looks like and definitely what a wife looks like in God's eyes? What does submission look like? So let's jump over to 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm not gonna read all the way through this, but I want you to take note of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and go ahead and just read that whole thing. Like I said, I'm not going to because I can feel my voice getting a little weak and we're not doing that today, Satan. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talks about the excellence of love. So we just talked about what it looks like to be an excellent woman, a worthy woman, an excellent wife. This highlights for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 what it looks like to really love according to God's standard. Why do I highlight this when I'm talking about being a worthy woman and being a wife? is because if we don't have love, we get we have nothing. So if we can go out here and put on our best, put on our best outfits, we're we're really we can we can get cute. We can be cute. We know how to talk the talk. We know how to pull them from here and from there. We know exactly how to do all these things when it comes to just the natural, right? 
but we don't have the ability to love on people. If we don't have the ability to express things in a kind manner, if we don't have the ability to forgive, then that means that we haven't really submitted truly, even as daughters. So if we're struggling to love on people, if we're struggling to love in the way that God tells us to love, meaning that we're enduring with patience, that we're kind, that we're thoughtful, that we're not jealous, that we don't envy nobody, that we're not bragging, that we're not proud or arrogant, that we're not rude. I'm just reading the verses that we're not all about what feels good to us. We're not easily angered. Those are the verses that are here for us. I want you guys to go back and study 1 Corinthians 13 in order for us to be submitted as daughters and as wives, daughters of God and as wives, we need to understand what love actually looks like. What is love according to God's standard? And so look through verses, look through 1 Corinthians chapter 13 for more on what love, look, love looks like and what excellent love looks like as you are pursuing what it means to be an excellent wife and a worthy woman. Okay, so look into that. That will, I can promise you this, when it comes to submission as a daughter of God and as a wife, the more we lean into and study 1 Corinthians 13 and just study and ask God for wisdom in love, or as we ask God to teach us how to love, because that has been a fervent prayer of mine day by day. I'm constantly asking God, teach me how to love my husband better. Teach me how to love my family better and love people that I have never met better, right? If we can really grasp the excellence of love, love is the thing that is going to truly reach the people that you're called to. It's going to be what allows you to reach and minister to your husband. It's going to allow you to reach your family and the people that have never met you. Love is also something, it doesn't just it's not just something that we give. It's also something that we are. Love is something, love is who you are. It's who you become. As you become more like Christ, we become more loving. So the love that liter love should literally become us as we grow and as we submit as daughters of God and then as we submit to our husbands, we are honoring God. We are expressing love God, love to God and submission to God when we honor our husbands. Okay, and that's what I'll get into in just a second. I'll stop with this last verse. I'll wrap up with this last verse rather. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Okay, this talks about, and again, I would encourage you to go ahead and read this whole thing, but I'm just going to highlight verses 1 through 9 because it specifically talks about submission. It talks about godly living, but the first verse is, in the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, okay? And it doesn't mean that you're inferior. It doesn't mean that there is not an equal expectation for your husband to honor you and to respect you, but it does mean that there is an order that God has put in place. He has placed himself at the very head. He has placed excuse me, he has placed himself at the very head. He has placed your husband, the head of the house, under him. And then he has placed you as the wife beneath the husband. Not beneath meaning inferior. I will emphasize that again. It does not mean that your husband should just be speaking to you any type of way. It doesn't mean that you are not worthy of respect. That goes against everything we just talked about in Proverbs 31. You are a worthy woman and you are a daughter of God. So, Shame on any man that would use these verses and try to twist them or taint them because that is, that's the work of the devil. But what, we, what we're seeing here are instructions in verses one through nine for how we are to be submitted to our husbands. And we see the order that God has created put in place. So it is God, the husband is to submit to God and to yield to God and everything concerning the family, concerning you. OK, and then you are submitted to your husband in that you are to yield to him. OK, you're supposed to give him that honor. You're supposed to give him that respect. You yield to him and you submit to him in the same way that you would Christ. And I don't mean you worship and you reverence your husband as Christ, but there is 
there is a comparison made when we're thinking about the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church, meaning the people of God. So when we're thinking about the relationship between Christ and the church, there's an illustration where we think about marriage, that literally the man is a representation of Jesus Christ. When we think about the relationship and we think about how Jesus Christ literally died for us, when we think about literally salvation that came from Christ and his love for us, and we think about us being the church, God compares and God sees marriage and the role of the husband. He places the husband in Christ's position, okay? He is not Christ. He places the husband in Christ's position, meaning that in the same way that Christ has loved the church, you should love your wife. You should do anything and everything for your wife. You should lead her. You should make her look more like Christ. You should make her look more like me. You should make her look more like God. Okay, so that is the dynamic and that's the order that God's put in place. It's God, it is your husband, and you are submitted to both your husband and to God. Okay, and we'll talk about this too. And you'll see this in the verses and this these are not the only verses in the Bible that submission shows up in, but these were the ones that I'd at least want to offer to you to start with. I will say this that and we could do a whole nother video on this but there are there are exceptions that god provides or i won't even say exceptions but there are protections in place for you as god's daughter and what do i mean by that as a wife you are submitted to your husband because that is your submission to god you submit to your husband you honor your husband because god told you to and you're submitted to God first. So because God told you to submit to your husband, you are submitting to your husband, right? God also puts protections in place, like I said, for you as his daughter, meaning that if there is the only opportunity, I'm not even going to use the word opportunity, there are instances where you are not able to submit to your husband, and those instances only fall under if the husband is actively leading you into sin, if the husband is walking into sin and trying to convince you to sin or asking you to sin, those are those are the protections that God has put in place. So nothing that we submit to should be going against the word of God. Nothing that we submit to should be going against God, period, right? Because if our husband, if that's the order that God put in place, that it's God, it's himself, God, it's our husband, and then it's us, that means that our husband is supposed to be reporting to, yielding to, submitting to God first, right? And then we are to be yielding and submitting to our husbands under God. All of us are under God, but that is the order that God's put in place. So what I mean by that is, there are things that God has put in place. There are protections that God has put in place for both you and your husband. And a part of that protection for you as a wife and as a worthy woman, God has, he sees fit for you as his daughter to be covered by the man, covered by your husband, and then covered by him. Both of you covered by him, but you covered, you have an extra layer of covering in there when you become a wife and your husband now steps in to cover you and become the head of the house. So this is how much God thinks of you as a daughter. Remember, this is how he, this is the first relationship that's established. You are his daughter first, and he sees fit for there to be so much covering for you, not just from him, but he's saying, let me put, let me put a covering, a head of the house in front of her as a layer of protection, as a covering for her because that is how he thinks of you. That is how he sees you. It doesn't mean that you're weaker. It doesn't mean that he doesn't trust He doesn't trust you. That's not what this means. This is how much he thinks of you. This is how much he considers your safety and your protection is that he would set the order up in this way. So I say all of this to say, this is why it's so important for us to understand and really get into deep into our spirit, our identity in God as a daughter of God. When we recognize that we are a daughter of God, we are able to submit with a heart of gratitude. We are more willing and we are more eager to submit first to God who created us. And then if God sends along a man to then step in 
in the place of Christ to cover us, to make us look more like Jesus, to make us look more like God and to be the covering over our house, the head of our house, then all the more I'm going to be joyful and I'm going to be eager to submit to who God sends to me. God has sent me a covering. I was already covered by God. Okay. I was already covered as a daughter of God, but now God has seen fit to send me another layer of covering in a husband. And so understand that your identity as a daughter of God is critical and it is the foundation to you stepping into the worthiness of who you are as a woman and who you are as a wife. I pray that this thing encourages you. Take them scriptures down. I shared a couple of them in the first. I think we actually just talked about Job in part one. But in part two of this thing, we went through Proverbs, 1 Corinthians, 1 Peter. So be sure to go back, rewind, get those verses and study them. Let me know what comes from this. Let me know what comes from either of these parts, both of them. I pray that both of them bless you, that they change your perspective. If you viewed submission in a different way or if you viewed it as a negative thing, I hope that you were encouraged and that you know that submission is literally an act or an expression of love and gratitude to your father because you're his daughter first. So when we go to submit to him, when we go to submit to the man of God that he sends us, when we become a wife, that is an act of gladness. It is an act of delight and it's an act of gratitude. It's saying, thank you. Thank you, God. You're such a good father. Thank you for thinking so much of me that you would cover me not just with your grace, but that you would send another layer of covering in my husband. So I love you guys so much. Again, I pray that this encourages you. Drop some thoughts in the comments if you have them, if there are other questions, if you want to dive deeper into any topics related to this, let me know. But until next time, I hope that y'all have a lovely rest of your week, lovely rest of your day, and I will see y'all.